Um, we had three great talks this morning, and I made a deal with the speakers who are going to follow me today. I'm going to like reset the bar a little lower here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I would, what I'd like to talk to you today about is some of the work on computational simulation. This is work. Uh, uh, we've been working on the Sim Center in collaboration with DesignSafe, also outside folks in this Center of Excellence doing the INCOR and other researchers and so forth, so the, the, the credit goes around. But to really focus on, on doing uh, simulation, I'm going to focus on high-resolution regional simulations. And the reason for this, I think it really promotes multidisciplinary work. If you think going from a hazard science through engineering to the social science, they're all built into regional simulations. I think it's also very integrative. All the research that goes on in laboratories, field reconnaissance and theory gets integrated through the simulations. And then I think it's also really impactful because by taking these simulations that I'll describe, we could really kind of galvanize the interest of uh, you know, causing action by you know, public and private sector on things not just related to one building at a time, but more looking at policies and so forth. All right. We heard this morning and a lot of examples, I'll just give a couple more, about how, unfortunately, it's often disasters that prompt us to take action. And a couple that I'll mention, 1971 San Fernando earthquake, a real wake-up call, uh, problems with non-ductile concrete structures, vulnerabilities to transportation system, hospital systems. You know, and after this, there was a number of actions to change building codes, different agencies paying more attention to hospital building safety, transportation. Um, but most notably, 1971, 1977 kicked off the NEHRP authorization that really brought the four federal agencies, NSF, NIST, uh, FEMA, and USGS together to really focus on you know, making a systemic change that we've seen play out over the decades since. Hurricane Andrew on the wind side, I think, really brought out some of the vulnerabilities that exist in uh, uh, different types of construction, particularly wood frame construction. Also, the challenges with large disasters like that on getting emergency relief, supplies, fragile supply chains out. And again, the state of Florida and the nation really stepped up with improved building codes for, for new buildings, emergency response. The state of Florida has a loss management association uh, kind of looking at insurance and types of issues like that. So things have moved forward. Hurricane Katrina went from a disaster to a catastrophe, where the, the displacement in particular of people was so large, it really brought the social dimension into the forefront, and showing we're not just kind of damaging buildings and damaging infrastructure, but, but we're kind of destroying families, we're destroying livelihoods, and we're destroying communities. And so the question is, how could we move ahead of doing things before disasters? And I think one way to do that is by thinking of disaster simulations. One that I'll mention, this was done in 2006, it was the, it was the 100th centennial of the 1906 earthquake, where the question was asked, well, what would happen to the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, if the 1906 earthquake happened today? Coincidentally, this was a year after Katrina hit, so that was still very much in the news and on people's minds. Well, the number of casualties, the damage to buildings, but in particular, the number of displaced people were kind of on the order in the Bay Area of what had just happened in Hurricane Katrina. So it really galvanized attention. But of course, we don't want to just look at the problems, we want to look for solutions. So one of the things the scenario studies do, just as real disasters do, is they point out some of your key vulnerabilities. In this case, it was looking out of the casualties. It's a very small percentage of the buildings that are causing most of the casualties. So you don't have to fix every building. You just have to find non-ductile concrete, soft story buildings, fix those. Also, it pointed out loss of rental housing, and often rent-controlled housing, recognizing if you lose those buildings, it changes the demographics forever, um, and essential infrastructure. So this scenario study really, I think, prompted action in the city of San Francisco, a landmark bill to, to mandate um, the evaluation and retrofit of soft story buildings. John Vanderlyn talked about this morning some of the research that, that backed this up. Um, but, you know, and this was a heavy lift because these are privately owned buildings. So for the city to mandate that, put the, you know, onto the owner of these buildings. But in this case, it was a pretty obvious problem. I think the, the scenarios helped communicate the problem to, you know, owners and the public. You know, and the fix on these buildings was relatively, in the big scheme of things, um, relatively cost effective. Also, San Francisco has looked at, uh, you know, a major project to upgrade its um, water system. It's getting its water from 150 miles away up in the Sierra, so a number of vulnerabilities along that. 
really major project, a little more straightforward because it was publicly funded, so getting it through is a different set of dynamics. But these are kind of examples of, of what can happen. But this was some of the low-hanging fruit, I would say. We still have vexing issues of some non-ductile concrete, other issues in communities. How do we address those? And so this is where I want to think about a next generation of simulations. The San Francisco study was done, built on Hazus, you know, now 25 years old. But what's the next generation thinking of high resolution, bringing high fidelity, multi-fidelity models to bear on all sorts of hazards? So this is where our computational simulation work is coming in. The computational framework shown by these puzzle pieces here really follows a performance-based approach. We're working left to right. You know, first you're carefully defining the assets, the building <coughs> inventories in the community, bringing into overlaying on that what are the hazard effects, uh, taking that through engineering analyses of what's the impact and the response of buildings and other infrastructure, translating that to losses, and finally coupling with that with the socioeconomic impacts on the community and finally looking towards recovery. We're shown as puzzle pieces because it's not one piece of software. There's a lot of specialized software out there. So the approach we've been taking is to kind of encapsulate different software and facilitate putting together these computational work flakes to, to, to lower the bar, I think, as Ellen talked earlier, you know, for people to use these sort of models. And working with DesignSafe then build this into a, a computational, you call it cyber infrastructure, that is using the high-performance computing facilities, using the data uh, depot at, at TAC, but also connecting it through the cloud to other web-based resources from the different federal agencies and data and so forth. But apart from the technology, by putting together these workflows and being able to use them, share models, share data, really building a community, you know, enabling collaborative research. So I'd like to walk through just a couple of pieces of those puzzles to, to think about the kind of challenges and the kind of work that we and others have been doing. Um, you know, so one is to build the inventory. So to, to start to harvest, if we want to know building inventories or infrastructure inventories, where do we get that information? Harvest information from tax databases, real estate. Um, also LIDAR, we heard this morning, I think in Tracy's talk, you know, what kicked off USGS doing a major LIDAR scan. So that's a new data set that could start to inform the inventory. So to package this all together and to really go for high resolution, that is part building, parcel by parcel, uh, bridge by bridge, really zooming in on the details rather than just doing a, a regional simulation and aggregate. Of course, the available data doesn't ha often have all the information we need to populate our models. So this is where, say, an effort using uh, artificial intelligence, looking at image recognition from satellite images, from street view images, for example, and discerning features of buildings that are important for our models. For example, some of the work, uh, kind of a testbed study was looking at uh, houses and different roof shapes and materials, elevation above grade that's important for flooding and, and for wind type things. Um, and, and inferring these sort of details that kind of, again, populate these data sets that then feed into our simulations. Next is bringing in the hazard characterization. And here I think the key is, is to tap into all the work that's being done by different groups and to make kind of a seamless connection kind of upstream to the hazards. You know, so if you think in the, the hurricane and wind arena, it's, it's you know, looking at hurricane tracks, looking at simulated wind fields, uh, simulated surge. And these could be simulated or they could be past events or they could be recent events. But the idea to couple these all together and bring them into the workflows. Uh, similarly, on the earthquake side, um, so, so looking at USGS, probabilistic seismic hazard mapping of faults, fault ruptures, ground motion models, also simulated ground motions to bring this more seamlessly in. And as you see on the, the, the graphics here, it involves a lot of external federal agencies, also agencies, international agencies, and other big research centers, but the idea to integrate it and make it easier to bring that to bear on the problem that you want to study. Next, we'll go forward to looking at kind of local response. This is kind of the arena where, where myself and many of us who've, who've kind of worked um, kind of looking at the response of buildings and things at a local scale. Uh, so you could think, for example, of fluid flows, say wind flows around buildings to do high fidelity CFD type models where you could get wind flows and pressures and then start to understand the pressures and the damage they cause to buildings. But it could also be wind flows that are, that are looking at if there's a hazardous material release, how that's going to flow through. This morning we heard about urban heat island effects, CFD type models looking at those sorts of issues as well. That's just one example. 
uh, we go over on the earthquake side, giving equal, equal time here, you know, computational finite element models of buildings and their foundations, soil deformations, and so forth. And in both of these cases, it's really important, this is where we tie in with experiments, because experiments, laboratory experiments, and field observations, you know, help us understand the underlying behavior and then provide data against which we could calibrate and validate our models. So in fact, the more we do modeling, the more data, the more experiments we need, because we're asking tougher questions. Next is carrying this forward to uh, kind of damage and loss, so taking the response. And so here it's kind of building up libraries of different models, data sets, fragility functions that can translate the response of a structure into what are going to be loss ratios, repair costs, downtimes, and so forth. And as many of us are familiar with kind of hazards type level that are informed by a combination of empirical evidence and judgment on all the different types, but, but relatively, um, we'll call it simplistic models, but that are easy to apply. But then higher fidelity ones, that for those familiar in, in earthquake, FEMA P58 following a detailed component-based performance-based approach, really going into much more detail. So what we want to do is to collect these models, and, and we're not creating them, it's the community that's creating them from laboratory testing, observation, and other detailed analyses, but to really build them out equally in equal fidelity for all sorts of hazards, and then also for all sorts of facilities, not just <coughs> buildings, but going into infrastructure components. And finally, the last piece of the puzzle is going forward and taking it into the socioeconomic realm. So it's collecting information on the demographics of communities, uh, understanding in terms of recovery, what the financing mechanisms that are available and so forth. And again, bringing together the data sets, but importantly too, bringing together the models, agent-based models and so forth that can help to characterize these effects. And so now that we've kind of gone through that framework, I just want to give a few examples of, given that we have it, what can we do with it? What can we do with these high-resolution regional simulations that we couldn't do with, say, aggregated ones on a census track? So one example is, this is a project from the California Earthquake Authority who was interested in how do they incentivize homeowners to spend money to retrofit their homes that have these vulnerable, uh, uh, unbraced um, foundation walls. And in order to do that, they were interested in, in getting kind of higher fidelity loss models. That is to understand every house is not the same. So a different response of a one-story, two-story house, depending on the types of finishes, wood siding versus stucco, where the house is located, what it ages, that if we could get higher fidelity models, that could help uh, demonstrate to people what the loss of their house might be, their specific house based on its characteristics, and also with these loss models, building them into insurance-type models and, and giving, say, insurance <coughs> discount uh, for, for ret you know, if a homeowner's undertake this retrofit, so kind of incentivizing things. And now to do this sort of research required these computational workflows to look at uh, tens of thousands of different archetypes of buildings and many permutations of that to pick up the uncertainties to come up with these sort of loss functions. Next, we, we have those improved loss functions, but the ultimate proof is how they bear out in the field. So if you imagine going to a regional simulation, um, how we could build in these models, and then after a disaster occurs, collect real-time data validation of those, or at least checking of those. This is an example, actually, Tracy uh, Kajusi Correa uh, worked on a test bed with the Sim Center, kind of doing a, the hurricane simulation. This was of the Lake Charles, Louisiana, looking at the damage there from Hurricane Laura. And then coincidentally, uh, but intentionally, the, the steer was also out collecting information on the observed damage so we could start to calibrate the models. And one can imagine if you could start to spin up these regional simulations more quickly, it becomes more routine, that they would become a standard part of reconnaissance, that is, helping guide the reconnaissance going out, and then as data is collected, bringing that back and quickly assimilating into the analyses, improving our models, and so forth. So it's a really integrating mechanism. Another example, uh, city of San Francisco, but it could be any city, was looking at uh, recovery of its dense urban downtown, a mixture of tall buildings, low-rise buildings, roadway, lots of people down there, at least pre-COVID. <laughs> uh, but, but looking at the recovery, we could look at the damage of individual buildings, but what's special about a downtown? So one of the topics that was looked at here was tall buildings, many of the older vulnerable say steel moment, building, moment frame buildings built before the Northridge earthquake, or it could be non-ductile concrete, that if they get damaged in a stability situation, 
uh, where a safety cordon might have to be put up around them. And this was demonstrated most dramatically in the uh, Christchurch earthquake. You know, that that could really impede not just the recovery of that damaged building itself, but many of its neighbors around it. So the idea is to how do you kind of understand this? Running simulations, kind of multi-fidelity, high fidelity of the tall buildings and lower fidelity of buildings around it, recognize they're all damaged and they all need to, to recover. And then look what happens playing out a few months after the earthquake. And in this case, it's really demonstrated that if you get some of these tall buildings that are difficult to assess and stabilize and fix, that in fact the damage can linger not only in them, but in the surrounding area. So this kind of information can equip then cities to start to think about the hard lift of requiring some sort of assessment and potentially retrofit of certain buildings. Looking at hurricane simulations, this is some work uh, Rachel Davidson and colleagues worked on. You know, the idea is if you have these models that can identify the, how many people are in a certain area, uh, the location of the people, and also then doing the simulation of the storm to understand the, the, uh, the flooding that could be coastal inundation and increasingly hear more and more about the inland flooding, even from hurricanes, coupling that with wind speed. So you identify that. And, and then if you're interested in looking at evacuation, if you do these things before an event, you could start to look at evacuation routes. Are they adequate? Where are the shelters? Where do people need to get to? Are the shelters adequate? Where are the pinch points in there to identify the vulnerabilities before the event? And even as the events are playing out, Hurricane Ian, we heard this in the news, it's really tough for the folks that have to require evacuations to know where are they to evacuate from? There's two scenarios that's shown here that show the evacuation area would be quite different depending on if the storm veers one way or another. Where do you evacuate from? Where do you evacuate to? And when do you pull the trigger on that? You know, and, and the longer you wait, of course, the storm, you know more where it's going, but the longer you wait, it's gonna be harder to evacuate. If we know information ahead of time, we could help inform these decisions better. The other aspect, each, each uh, disaster brings up that the key vulnerability and what really affects people and families and communities is the recovery of housing, be it low-rise housing, high-rise housing, incidental housing. Um, so understanding the effect on housing, but also the recovery. This is a, a study that was done at University of British Columbia, Rodrigo Costa, Stephanie Chang, and colleagues, um, looking at this question and trying to understand in a community, what are the characteristics of a community, the building stock, in terms of when it was built, is it built to code or not built to code? But also then looking at the demographics of the community, kind of income levels of folks who live there, whether they're homeowners or whether they're renters, issues like that, single family. Um, so recognizing what's the population that's in the area and then doing a, a simulation to think about, okay, if damage occurs to certain structures and now, now you start to have models that are informed by by post-earthquake observations, surveys, and so forth, understanding the recovery process. And the key thing here is to see where are the disproportionate impacts, you know. So in this case, not surprisingly, it's shown in red here, is, you know, it's, it's the vulnerable old buildings, number one, uh, but it's also those that recover slowly tend to be low income. They also tend to be rental rather than homeowner. They tend to be multifamily. So, so these are the vulnerabilities. Now, you don't need this study to point out these vulnerabilities, but what these simulations do in high resolution, they tell you the magnitude of the problem, not just that you have the problem, what's the magnitude, and then you could start to think about what sort of policies and what sort of resources are needed to kind of reconcile, you know, to equal a playing field or something and have kind of targeted uh, efforts to improve resilience. I can't believe it, I'm looking at this clock, I'm way ahead of time. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Take a breath and slow down. <laughs> Dan's glaring at me over there. No, keep going, Greg. Uh, so, uh, the other thing to remember is that the risk is not static. Uh, we, I think, heard this in a number of the panel discussions this morning, is that, you know, as populations grow, as populations move into more vulnerable areas, cities tend to grow from the, from the inside out. And the reason they're settled in the inside, that's the high ground, that's the firm ground. As they grow out, they're in the low ground and the soft ground, more vulnerable, or they might just wanna to move to the coast. So there's a lot of reasons why the risk will continue to increase. So when we think about doing these uh, regional simulations, we could take a snapshot at the present to understand what our current risk is. But equally important 
is to project that into the future to see how that risk is going to increase. And obviously, there's some speculation here on what's urban growth going to be and so forth. But it's really important then to say that whatever steps we take today, changes in building codes, there'll be a few buildings replaced over the next 50 years. Um, but even retrofit programs take years to play out. And, and other programs, social programs and so forth, we heard today um, from Jack Mazaros how it took two years just to figure out the question. But nevertheless, we, we can't stop doing this. And, and the idea is if we take these simulations, make a cut at what's going to happen in the future, it kind of gives us that confidence to go forward and to, and to recognize, too, that the impact and the benefit won't be felt for some years in the future, but this is the time. So kind of bringing that back to my, my final slide for this framework, hopefully I've convinced you of the usefulness of this sort of approach, you know, kind of as a collaborative mechanism as an integrative mechanism, but kind of just like the risk, it's not static. And so the whole idea of this is you continue to, to build this out with more puzzle pieces. And as examples, you could imagine on the upstream side, defining the assets in a community, urban growth models, you start to look in the future, policy interventions, how is that going to change the building stock or the infrastructure stock um, or the social stock of communities? and then the changing demographics. So you can imagine studies to build that in on the front end. Going along these puzzle pieces, there's always room for better models, um, especially in light of climate change. A lot of the weather and the hazard, you know, the weather hazard and hurricane models will change. Similarly, on how we assess buildings and infrastructure, there's always more information, better models, and there'll be new materials, as we heard this morning from Reggie. Um, Multi-hazard, starting to think about that. You know, and finally, if you bring it to the, to the far end, kind of the downstream, the impact of community, I think we're just really starting to forge these links now and understanding each other's language. I'm looking over here at Lori, who'll be up here in a minute, uh, talking after me. You know, what sort of data should come out of these simulations that help inform the socioeconomic kind of questions? And then as folks start to do recovery modeling, gaining empirical evidence and building that into agent-based models, discrete choice models to understand how recovery plays out, um, to build kind of those as another puzzle piece and extend that out so that we can make better entire simulations and therefore make better decisions in the process. And of course, as we've heard kind of throughout today's talk, having a network of individuals who are collaborating, having the facilities laboratory facilities, reconnaissance facilities, cyber infrastructure and everything is really essential to making this happen and the collaborations. So with that, thanks for your attention. <laughs>